All right. All right, from the Susan Fairfax City, we are very grateful that Bern Friedman accepted our invitation to our show. Bern, welcome to my humble podcast. Hello, my pleasure. No problem. Uh, Bern, let me go back to the beginning. You know, how did you start in music and and tell me about, you know, where your family in the music business, where you're taking some piano lessons when you were a kid or guitar lesson? But what's the, what, let's go back way to the beginning. Okay, the beginning is 1979 when I started recording generally like an idiot would do with literally no knowledge about music because my parents didn't have any musical background. The only sound source at that time would have been TV or radio. Basically the hits of the late 70s, that would be the information source. So um, the recording process started in 1979 because I was fortunate to own a tape deck and a microphone by then and decided to record everything. So ever since that time, I have an archive of all the tapes of each session has always been recorded. So I would not have started making any music without the opportunity of recording it at the same time. I see. And so over the years, until the recording devices would be more professional, I accumulated an archive of hundreds of tapes, which functions as a perfect audio diary. So I could always look back into the archive and see um, what the what the thinking was. I could relate the audio archive to my personal history, to events of the past, because any recording would also be a memory device. You would record your memories. They are imprinted into the audio. But uh, obviously, in the very beginning, I didn't have any instrument. So I was building instruments myself with a shoebox, rubber bands on top of the shoebox, the microphone inside of the shoebox, and lots of found objects that would make any noise. And I would invite my sister or my close friends to cooperate in the recordings to make noises themselves. They would all be, we would be gathering around the microphone, start the session, and instantaneously compose something. I got it, yeah. And we it, yeah. would make a break, announce the next track, and start composing instantaneously the next track, and so on and so on, until the tape was finished. So I'm, I'm used to create the music instantaneously and it has been a method of performing even on stage so later on in 81 and 82 we formed like my group of friends we would form bands in any constellations and partly record in a rehearsal room or perform live in the same instantaneous fashion. That means the principle was to, to never prepare, to, to just get the first take right and see if, if it makes sense anyway, no? in, the, in the end. So after all, we would be listening back to the tape, give titles to the tracks and sort out the terrible ones from the more fortunate experiments and eventually maybe there was one piece on the tape that was not too bad and we would collect it and release in an edition of 50 tapes maybe during the 80s we would release the tape to to the local local scene and that well that what what people thought about that at the beginning you send it to Ray, Ray to your friend to a radio and you no, they were they receptive? I grew up in a fairly small town. I see. Yeah. And I should add 
that I didn't conceive myself a musician early on until the early 90s because there was a second career so to speak developing which was the arts the fine arts yeah so in the in the 80s i decided i should pursue fine arts studies and that's where where the energy went during the 80s so i started studying fine arts in my hometown which is kassel and most of what we do there what we what we did there wasn't visual arts but we would continue exploring sound territory more or less performances performances related to the to the field of fine arts we would maybe develop soundtracks for for other artists to perform or would perform live and also record tapes so most of it was concerned with music but but still i wouldn't consider myself a serious part of the music scene so i didn't reach out to labels simply because i wasn't wasn't confident enough of being being a musician and secondly <clears throat> there weren't many opportunities in Kassel <clears throat> we've had the record shops <clears throat> we've had a music scene but there weren't any labels around for instance or publishers we would have needed to settle and perform in Berlin or in Cologne or in Hamburg or in Munich maybe but Kassel was basically only known for the Documenta art exhibition taking place each five years. Right, right, right. And then, so, and then what, so you went to that part of your life where you study, you know, painting, performance, video, you began in the background working a little bit of music send it to your friend and then eventually right you make the decision well i want to put the audio and performance here but i want to concentrate in music going forward what what was the process and why did you decided to uh, put more attention to music and 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 leave the art scene behind you needed to mature yeah. As a musician, you felt that... Uh... No, it's been a deliberate decision. Okay. At a certain point, during the 80s, to, to, to the late 80s, where I've had already accumulated a private archive of lots of different musics, solistic or in the band context, yeah. I would in parallel in parallel investigate into into fine arts i would have had a job as a guard in a museum where i kept watching the paintings and um, taking care of the paintings so to speak it's just what you do as a student you hang out in the museum and you watch the audience the spectators um, meandering through the museum and i noticed that the art object is not something i'm interested in i would i would recognize that the impact that the, the piece of art as an object had on on a spectator is not comparable to the impact an audio piece can have on on, on a listener there's no relation. I just decided because emotionally, emotionally, it's just so much more impactful than any piece of art for me personally. So it's it's some sort of intuition, but but I knew I wasn't wrong with that. Maybe maybe. Today, it's not like this anymore because music is omnipresent everywhere. 
And the, the sense for music ha has maybe a little bit disintegrated or it doesn't have so much emotional value anymore. Maybe it has more value when, when you grow up as a teenager. I can tell you that sometimes when I was listening to interesting music, I couldn't even walk properly anymore. I, I, have, I lost my sense of balance. When the music was a little louder and I resonated with the music, I, could, I couldn't walk properly anymore. So I knew there's something about music which is a lot more impactful, almost magical, that the fine arts couldn't deliver. What fine arts can now deliver to me is the theory. So I can accept an interesting piece of art for being a theoretical object, for posing a certain idea that can be discussed, but not for the objective material value it has in that frame. Because it's in fact simply a little bit of dirt on canvas, objectively speaking. Yeah. So, I... so we construe the piece of art in our minds. Whereas with music, music will always have a direct connection. It will penetrate and induce each body cell. So we are completely embroiled with the frequency structure, whatever you want to call it. You can call it energy device. So it's something that is so much more powerful, that is even more powerful than anything that the lyrics can provide. That's why I also opted for instrumental music, because once you have lyrics involved, the music will be attached to a cultural background. It will be limited to the community that can understand those lyrics. For instance, if the music was sung in German, it won't go any further than the boundaries of Germany, except maybe for a few, for very few examples. So it limits the music to a cultural context. But what you want to do as an artist is you want to break free from the cultural context. You want to make, uh, you send your message to the possibly the widest audience so the whole world, that's, that's the target. You don't want to limit yourself to, to your subculture. That's also the reason why you would like to break free from the categories. You, want to, you don't want to be attached to any subcategory. And um, that's, that has ever been troubling for me because I have... a position that I, I've learned during my art studies, which is um, to, to, to um, create, to try to create your own message, your own sound signature, which is not related to any culture, basically. Uh, that means it stands alone as an argument amongst all the other arguments that fill the space, of, the space of music. Even ethnic music, classical music, in, in the total cosmos of music, it should have its, its own point of view, its own standpoint. Ideally, not related to any cultures. I, I, I understand. I, you know, I think you're from Germany, right? Berlin has always been the capital music of electronic music, right? So people like the, the Tangerine Dean, the Klaus Schulz, the Peter Bauman, Manuel Goshen, Asher Temples. Were you, were you listening that kind of music when you were, I don't know, you finished high school, when you were 18, what they call the gymnasium in Germany, and then between 20 and 22? You know, those were bands that were important in in Berlin, you were different, living in a different city, and that was before the internet and before cell phone. You do so; it's not that you could go to YouTube, you know, electronic music, Tangerine Dream, Peter Bauman, this or that, right? So, where are you, where in early 
any like was was you knew who they were or in many ways influence you or yeah, yeah. we uh, I have tried to cut the story really short when I was talking about the eighties but yeah there was so much happening in such a short period of time yeah that even a year as a measurement wouldn't mm. accommodate all the things that had happened. For instance, 1981 is a key year in that respect where we've had a stylistic explosion. Most of the landmark recordings would come out around the year 81 in Germany and internationally because the do-it-yourself methods would develop. The machines would be introduced into popular music. The tools would become more cheaper. Uh, just the music had this infectious, this widespread effect on, on, on such a broad public that from then on you, you, you would you would be so keen to check out all the all the, the music that is that was available and of course the most significant bands had already released their records by then and uh, friends of mine they the older friends they would have listened to Ashra Temple Danger and Dream and I grew fond of those bands quite quickly but first of all I, I would have started the most impactful track of my life is probably Tubeway Army, Our Friends Electric, before everything else. That's because that's it was available through the mainstream. It's such a, an outstanding piece of pop music that is unthinkable of today being on top one in the UK charts for, for a few weeks because it defies all the recipes of pop music. It's not even singing, there's no refrain, it's just a, a challenge. It, it puts the recipes of pop music to question, in fact. It was so impactful that I would be listening to it like days long, non-stop. And wow. um, yeah, in the same way, I would listen to Jean-Michel Jarre. I just thought, oh my God, this sequence, this short section is so beautiful. Why doesn't he produce it 10 minutes long. Yeah. When I started playing drums in 1982, I would start playing drums along to Jean-Michel Jarre's synth sequences. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So all the music that was somehow strange, I would immediately embrace it. You know? So as if the consciousness is always looking for something new, to make a new experience. So with your own music, or me, with my own music, I would try to allow consciousness to, to make another new experience. Probably that's also part of the reason why we decided to compose instantaneously, like so many other bands did. Ken, more or less, would have done that. Not all of their repertoire, but a great percentage of the repertoire is instantaneous composition. And I, I would guess Amon Duel, Tangerine Dream, and uh, Ashrat Temple, etc., Klaus Schulze, they would create music in the same way, on the same principle. Just to not predetermine anything, but let the magical moment happen Ooh. by sheer practice, by by this, uh, by by approaching this very moment, if if you pre predetermine, if you preempt that moment, it will slip you your, through your fingers. So uh, it's already gone. It's, it's very very unfortunate thing. Music keeps being a, a great mystery. You know? That's why. You will still be here in 20 years and, and uh, do these interviews, I suppose. You will always hear something different. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, oh. like I told you before, before we got recorded music, I, I, I'm not a musician. I don't play any instrument. 
I, I don't know how to read music, but music has always been an important part of my life since I was a little kid. And uh, uh, I knew back then that I wouldn't be a musician because I don't have the skills. But I was buying music when I came to the United States to study. I, I go to a lot of concerts and I realized at the beginning, you know, the electronic music was important to me, right? So I, I knew who Amoldu was and Can and Tangerine Dream probably was the first band that I listened to in that three albums, right? In that electronic music. Um, but, and then eventually, right, after I finished my graduate school, I began going to concerts, buying music, and I realized that I have a wide range of stuff, right? So there's some music I don't, I don't understand. I I suppose I don't like it, but but I always fascinated by uh, it's appealing to me. You know the 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 jazz, the rock, uh, electronic music. You know your type of music, film film score. I knew at the time who Popol Boo was, and and they were and um, I interviewed a couple of guys from the band and. And and I began buying a lot of music, you know, uh, soundtracks, right? Yeah, movies that I never seen. Uh, and I put my headphone and I tried to think how this music could be used in a movie or what the directors were thinking about that. And and by person, right? I have seen a lot of music. A lot of film score that are important to me, uh, where the music is not that great, according to me, right? So Sorry, where I, the music is not? It's not that great. You know, I have seen a lot of music where the movies where yeah. the music is not great, and for the film and uh, and I and I and I realized, well, I I like a lot of stuff. You know, some music it's 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 appealing to me, right? And another. No, no. So I, 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 during the pandemic, right, I decided, well, I'm working for home. Maybe I should open a radio, <laughs> send the link to friend. Then I open another one and, uh, and, uh, in a way to pay tribute to all the musicians out there, I opened the YouTube channel and the rest is history, you know? So um, it's, uh, I'm very happy. To talk like people yourself about them expressing how music came to the life, you know why music is important to them, how difficult it is to be to be a musician and so forth. So it's uh, it's <laughs> it's a long answer to to, to yeah. It, uh, it's a uh, you know we live in crazy times, you know, and uh, and uh, music in many ways, in my opinion, can I hope save the world, you know. So. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's also been weaponized at the moment as a tool of identity politics. You know what? In the 80s, there was yeah. this slot. This new slot was introduced into the record shop, which was alternative music. So from then on, more and more slots were introduced into the record shop. Like you would have world music there yeah. next to the Beatles. So why would the Beatles not be in the world music section? Because the Beatles are listened to all over the world. All right. They yeah. belong to world music. So Ooh. what you can see, all those categorizations of music have led to misunderstanding the music. It's as if it was an ongoing identity politics game already. But it doesn't harm anybody since it's the, the territory of music. It's just a game. So you would have a band, you would have a fake band, you would have another name, you would have a simulation of a band, you, you would play with deception, you would play with identity. So now we have so many categories of house music, so many categories of heavy metal. So we we are trained in constructing identities and 
it didn't occur to be a problem until now, where we actually have the identity politics going on all over the place. You have to be on the right side. You have to virtue signal which side you are on. You cannot play life in Russia anymore. Otherwise, you get a shitstorm. You cannot do this and that. In other words, now the music is also has also been weaponized. Beforehand, the distribution platforms would be weaponized. They would ask you, no, not ask you, they would exclude Russia from the territories of music. You're not allowed to sell your music to Russian people anymore. I see. So um, it's, it's really sad, and especially with the seizure that the so-called pandemic has posed upon the society. It's, it's gotten worse. We've had DJs making lockdown sessions or playing in clubs without any audience. How crazy is that? They would say, we are DJs. We don't care if we have an audience or not. And now, after the so-called pandemic, they expect to have an audience, but they prove they don't need an audience. So why would the club need the DJ in the first place? They have proven that the people are not of any importance. Uh, what, what, what I'm saying is we, unfortunately, even the magical world of music has entered this political battle. And it's very difficult to, to, to push aside. That's why I'm always opting for the musicians to keep outside of the culture because music is so much more powerful than the political game. Yep. Yeah, it will all people of the world will be able to resonate with the music despite of their traditions, despite of their culture. And yep. that's something to explore with the music. And so it's important not to be embroiled into these into these games, because in the end of the day, it's just a distraction because other more important political things are being introduced in the background while the people are fighting against each other. I, I know it I makes, makes a lot of sense. I, I completely agree with you. In uh, One of your first recordings was done with Wolfram in from 78 to 82, I think it was released under the name T-O-H-X in 89. Um, so at the time you began, I think, um, playing live in, right? You were living in Cologne, I think, right? And so you No, decided, not yet. No, no. Uh, wait, I was yet? still in Kassel. The Kassel. work I did with Der Spürer yeah. is dating from 86 to 90, 91. Yeah, got it. Yeah. But uh, I was still in, living in Kassel. I got it. And then did you end up moving right after that? And yeah, and uh, where you and and you began playing live, I believe, right? I think the first live concert was in in the high school with a three piece band in in eighty three, eighty two, maybe. I got it. I got it. And then we would have small gigs in in a band called Rap El Tox, mm. which is uh, three pseudonyms, like uh, instantaneous composing. The group existed one year only, unfortunately. But from then on, you could say every two weeks, there was a new group constellation, a new formation. It was really crazy, as I said, an explosion of of creativity and stylistic, heterogeneous uh, visions of music. Really um, too quick to keep track. Fortunately, I have the tapes, but it's not worth mentioning all the different projects, I don't think. But it became more serious in the early 90s, by which... You may have heard of Some More Crime. Yeah, yeah, it's been yeah. the first project that 
released a record to a wider public, or in total three three records to a wider public until '93, when I went to Cologne. I got it. I got it. I and then still, I wouldn't take my um, my career too seriously because by then I could not. I wasn't able to make a living from the music. But by the end of the 90s, I, I was asked to compose stuff for video and television more, for a more functional, like, like commissioned work I would do in parallel. So from then on, I managed to make a living from the music. And this was when I thought, okay, all right, I should take this more serious. and. I cannot do anything else from now on if I want to really make a difference. So all the energy went into music, say from, from 96, 97 onwards, when I was signed to Ninja Tune, like to an international label, and I got more requests coming in for record releases, but actually more than I could handle. So from then on, I think the the whole career turned into turned into something serious, more than just um, experimenting. Yeah, I, I, also I, promotion was involved and selling yourself. All the trouble began basically. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. And then I think around some year later in the year. Uh, 2000, you launch your own regular label. I think it's called Non Place. I think you have close to, I don't know, more than 50 releases uh, today, right? 57 currently. 57. I got it. Wow, good for you, man. Yeah. How difficult it was to open up your own regular oh, label and, and then begin promoting and recruiting artists that can be there and so forth. Yes, but I had a really helping hand. A very good friend of mine, Oke Göttlich, who would then, after after that project, he would open up a, a digital download platform himself, a company for for the digital dis distribution of music. He would help me set up the label. And he would also be, you would say, the manager the person who would represent the label to the distributor and to to other labels in the, in, the, in the international music world. It was also him who encouraged me to do it because even in 2000, everybody else would tell me, forget about it, it's over now, the sales are going down, it's too difficult, everybody's making music. So whenever I was introduced into the music world, the the climate was pretty frustrating, rather negative. Labels would die. You wouldn't receive your money. Like you would lose 10,000, 20,000 euros. And it, it didn't look, it didn't look very promising, to be honest, even back then. And of course, it has gone so much worse to the extent that you could say today there is literally no music business anymore. So since 24 years, you could say we also at the same time have no creative development in the pop music anymore, in, in the collective Western pop music, so to speak, with the words of Mark Fisher. He would term it the slow cancellation of the future. In other words, there's no remarkable musical development that can be attached to a certain period of time. So when we now look back to, to the late 70s, to the early 80s, we could very well distinguish between the musical landmarks from that time. They would be related to its cultural time. But this is, since the 2000s, no longer possible because we don't know how 2012 sounds any different from 2018 or 2020. Yeah, 
There's no, I mean, we cannot relate to it anymore. There's no memory of, of the last 24 years. So um, the only progress that was made is the technical process, like how music is distributed, how music is consumed. These things have changed, but the meta, the music itself, is, has only been regurgitated over and over again. Like re-releases, cover music, um, Im Im imitations of the past. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the big problem. And uh, you can call it a standstill or the collapse, collapse of the, of the Western, Western world. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, and, and, and like you say, you know, even if you have a, um, a regular label with, with great names, a great musician, you know, fewer and fewer people are buying CDs. And vinyl, you know, the thing go to a stream, and people don't have patience. They will listen to a record, a CD, in in a minute. You know, ten seconds for song, next ten second next. The 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 Spotify. You need to have like a millions of hits to get a check for ten dollars. Um, Bad camp is is fair because you get ninety cents of a dollar, right? So it it's it's. You know, it's very difficult to be a musician, LA, very difficult to make a living on the music business, you know, and especially in your area, right? So in your field, you know, so. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's I don't true. know, I don't, I don't have the answer. I don't. <laughs> uh, it's there are uh, the answers yeah. are not so important. The right questions are important, I think. Yeah. For instance, we could ask ourselves, how much of the current problem has to do with the history of deception? So mm -hmm. how much of the whole process of the pop, mu popular music development has been instigated by, by the military mm -hmm. or not? How much of it is, is maybe a product of a military operation under under the under the banner the banner of pacification and control because when you have so many bright minds exhausting themselves in the ter territory of music which is more or less a solo a, a very narrow I, I don't want to say egoistic but a self-reflective process. Those people will never investigate any energy into the public sphere and form resistance amongst the citizens and and investigate into political debate, you know, in, in, in investigate into forming the culture, more into Because everybody's instead concerned with their own careers. Yeah, no, I know exactly. You know, I, I know exactly. I'm not sure because I've I've not been brought up. My socialization is the early '80s, basically. But I wonder, with the Beatles and those bands from California, how much is actually based upon Tavistock? mind control and those secret service, service investigations. Also, Timothy Leary's approach to, to the effects of LSD and so forth. Mm -hmm. There might be something in there which is not yet fully analyzed and would shed a completely different light on musical production mm -hmm. until today. A different sort of light than we tend to believe, and we we tend to discuss. Uh, and then at the same time, you could see 
that the song contest, the Eurovision Song Contest, for instance, as an example, is a purely satanic environment to promote everything but music. It sells sex. Uh, it's, it's just a horror show, if you like. And that's not arbitrary. The, these projects follow a certain script. And some people, some clever people may think, oh, this is how it works. So we have to assimilate to that. And they follow the recipe, not knowing that actually a military program has fundamentally been behind it to, to convey such contents to the wider public. It's, it's really disturbing to think about the effects it may have on, on kids watching these, watching these programs. Mm. So there, there must be an agenda behind it. The agenda of, um, of destroying the family unit, destroying the natural authority, destroying the natural law, in my opinion, probably to introduce robots to normalize the idea of transgenderism, to normalize all sorts of um, disgusting um, egotistical values, like pursue your pleasure in life. Yeah, you are the most important. You have to make yourself, you have to express yourself, basically. No? You have to follow your, um, your pleasure. So the ultimate command is enjoy yourself, no matter what. Yeah? That's, that's the most important thing. If you haven't enjoyed yourself, then your life your life was a waste so to speak so people have the pressure to express in themselves to enjoy themselves to make sense of all liberties and the question is what do you do when you jump into an ocean and someone tells you okay now you can swim into any direction you want is, is this sense of liberty which I suppose the strategy in there is to to at atomize people from each other, to cancel the bond between friends, between family, between natural relationships. So everybody is pursuing an, an egotistical career in order to fulfill their desires, their fantasies. I think yes. that's, that's, that's a big complex that is conveyed with the music today, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I know, I know. But you are right, you know, asking the right question is, is the key, instead of, you know, getting, yeah. getting, getting a hold of the answer. And um, your music in many ways is, difficult to pin down because between genres but um but you because you you have i was listening to your music yesterday again and you have areas in electronic experimental music uh primordial sound and so on so forth how would you like in many ways you have no choice right you do what you like and 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 in one and it's great that people cannot categorize you, you know, in, or put yourself in one area, in one category. That's what makes Bernd Friedman unique because he's trying to do this, this, whatever this might be, right? So, and, and, and then, as I say, you, you know, we are so used in society well, you are a electronic musician guy, you are a film composer, you are just experimental stuff. But you have touched, you know, this, this and that. And, and it's, it's great that you do that. It what makes you unique, I suppose, right? 
Yes, uh, I've always loved to mix things up. I, yep. I, and um, I never think about it, in fact. Yeah. I, I just mix, mix it up. For instance, there's this one piece that incorporates the drums of Yaki Liebezeit, the lyrics of the singing of David Sylvian, my programmings, the clarinet of Hayden Chisholm, the yep. guitar of Tim Mozart, like lots of people who naturally would have never joined and Ooh. even are to some extent opposed to each other, I just threw together and mixed them up. And to me, it makes sense somehow. Uh, to many people, it's an offense. But uh, from my intuitive standpoint as an artist, like an outsider standpoint, uh, that's that's what I'm interested in, to, to evoke the the perception of strangeness, if you like, of making uh, a new musical experience, but a comprehensive one, because nothing is easier than to destroy the existing structures. Mm. And uh, maybe the second aspect of it is the exploration of the odd numbers, the uneven numbers in in groove. Maybe that's a little bit too technical for you and the listeners, but you may have noticed that most of the tracks from certainly the last 20 years feature uneven numbers, though these are grooves that are not common to Western culture. You don't hear them very often, almost never because it's not, it doesn't belong to the common repertoire of pop music, that you have something beyond the 4-4 four, four beat. The even beat. Yeah. Yeah, but no, by, by deliberately choosing these odd numbers, I would automatically introduce something that has a, has a different quality. It's a different mode. Like I'm changing the mode, and each number is a different mode. Like you change the scale in music. Let's not go further into the details, but I can tell you that this formal approach allows me to, to create compositions that will automatically be distinguished from what we know of Western popular culture. They have more in common with the ancient form of drumming. What small tribes all over the world would have practiced. Those tribes would arrive at the same conclusions because it's something that you learn from practice. Whereas in the West, we would learn from reading the sheet the score but the score doesn't tell you how to do things exactly exactly right no I, I agree. it's a very important distinction that's why i've also called the label non-place because mm. i wanted to deliberately position it outside of of a territory outside of the culture and I, the, I, the reason why is on the, in the basis is these are these uneven rhythms that are naturally achieved. It's not, not a product of the mind. And the method is not even man-made. This is a natural conclusion. This is how you do, do it properly. It's natural. But it's not common in the West. No, I, 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 I understand. I, I was listening also to the album that you, you did with, of course, I think you referred before, with Jackie and David Sylvian, I think it's called uh, Out in the Stick as Out, well. Out in the Sticks, yes. Yeah, it, uh, it, uh, it's very good, actually. I, I, I really like it, you know. So um, it's, uh, you, that type of music is very, it was, it, it is very appealing to me, but, you know, uh, it's, you go in, it's not appealing to, 
you know, mass audiences, right? So it, it's, um, and you don't have to be, you know, you chose to do this type of music and that's your life and so forth, but um, it's like an itch, right? Which, you know, and it's, it, that, that's a great album. And that's, that's very good. It's, I don't know, I, for music, for me, when I listen to new track or new art or new album, uh, you know, either the music is appealing to me or it's not. I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, you know, like in country music, right? I here in the United States, very importantly, I don't understand the lyrics that much, and it's not appealing to me. But people do very well, right? The same in in um, you know classical music, you know, opera, view fewer and fewer people. Uh, you go to that type of that type of concerts, those worries, and music in in high school, the gymnasium in your country, right? It uh, it's it, it. There are no schools, and they are not putting money into music and music. So it's it's somehow you know when you become a musician in your case, you and you are part of a niche. It's it's you do what you like, but it's 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 difficult, right? To to make a living, so uh, it so happened that I like your, you know, that album and your type of music, you know. So, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Glad you like yeah. it. Yeah, and the other album that I really like it, I listened to. It was uh, the musical tradition of Central Europe. I think it was released in twenty nineteen. That's um, uh, that's also a, a great album. You know. Yeah. Um, like you, you keep moving around, you know. You like you said before, you try this and that, whatever is appealing to you, right? Whatever, as if you have no choice, right? Instead of you picking music, maybe it was the other way around. Music world, whatever the universal music selected you, and through you, you do this kind of stuff versus that kind of stuff, and so. But, yeah, I cannot disagree with that. Yeah. So yeah, I would would have said me. How did you start with music? It's like the music started me. In the first That's place. correct. Yeah. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's like there's there's nothing prohibited in the music. You can destroy the music, and it's fine. The music wouldn't wouldn't mind. So it's a very tricky thing to do because I like I like harmony. I like structure. I like repetition. I like when things are done properly, when 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 the groove is set properly. I like when it when it is accurate. I like the timing of the machine. So I, I would try to compose music uh, the way I think the music wants to be composed through the right practice, like through a balance of left and right, to, to get the tone right, to, to make it as accurate as possible. So it's a more positive approach by accepting the natural laws of the music instead of acting against those natural laws by saying we have to tear down the sound barrier we have to ignore the octave we cannot we, we should not repeat anything so i'm i'm a lot more conservative in in that i'm supporting the the natural laws that were provided from what we call music and one of those the most fundamental law is the law of the octave which means doubling and halving is completely natural to the to our world, to everything in our world, doubling and halving. And so, yeah, the the way I conceive of rhythms is based only upon the law of the octave. Um, it's very difficult to to understand that. Unless yeah. I would explain it in detail, and it would take sure. me thirty minutes at least to explain <laughs> I, it. I, I don't. Yeah, no, I know what you're but, saying. But what I want to say is, 
I'm trying to see how the energy wants to flow instead of imposing my my composer's will onto the music. Mm. So so much can be learned from practicing properly until it plays itself. That's part of the reason that Joao Paich Philippe, the drummer I work with now, yeah. and me in our new project, we we have coined the term automatic music. So the music with the right formula, the rhythmic structure executed in a proper way, in a natural way, will automatically compose, compose the right music. It will automatically throw out the right results. That's, that's the notion that we have of the music. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about Night Horses and the, the collaboration with David Sylvian and his brother. I think it was in October 2023. I think uh, David Sylvian was promoting uh, his album called Blemish. And, uh, and I think you end up meeting them in, in, in Cologne. I think David Sylvian listened to your work and, um, and he liked it. And, and uh, feel free to elaborate how that happened. I think they were, I read that somewhere that Steve was, uh, David Silva was working with his brother. They were not, you know, reaching a point to this can be released, you know. It's great, but we are not there yet. David Sylvian began to restore in blemish, and then they got a hold of you, and then the three of you took that particular first composition to the next level. I think in two, 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 right, 20, 2003, before the the Night Horses, where you end up, you know, um, releasing two, two albums. So feel free to elaborate on how did it happen, what, you, what memory do you have for that period? From what I understood, you know, from our conversations, David and Steve would be very attracted by the way I would I programmed the drums on the Flanger record templates. Yeah, that we Uwe Schmidt and me produced yeah. in 1996 in Chile. So. They were surprised to hear that all the drums on that record were programmed shot by shot, step by step. Although yeah. it sounds like there's a crazy jazz drummer yeah. playing those grooves. Cool. And yeah, I think they they would like to cooperate this in, in their music. But first of all, David asked me to produce a remix for the Plemish, for one of the Plemish tracks. Yeah, maybe to see how how this would uh, be accommodated in, in his in, in in his musical notions, and he accepted. He was really pleased by the result. So I provided him some of the sketches that I had made for Yaki and me, and he immediately wrote lyrics for it and passed me some of the ideas and I thought, oh, interesting. So maybe we could expand the project that I had with Yaki, the secret rhythms and incorporate David Sylvian singing on that project. But a, a few months later, he came up with another idea telling me that there was a chunk, a couple, a bunch of tracks that he had started with Steve and yeah. the new sketches of mine and his lyrics would fit really well into this larger bulk of work. So we decided to squeeze everything into this one new project. Got it. Yeah. I, 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 but you guys were, were you guys in the same room or he was sending your stuff, you do your work, send it back. So it was... Um, we didn't work yeah, in the same probably, studio. Huh? We did not work together in the same studio. I got it. Yeah, that's if, what. If that's what you wanted to. Yeah, 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 yeah. We would meet meet up and discuss these things in person or on the phone, 
Yeah. But we would not um, work in the studio, unfortunately. That didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got it. I think uh, he the the remixes that you were referring is I think it's called the the Wood Son versus the Only Daughter, right? Um, and, yes. Uh, and then you know, and then um, then you guys. I think uh, you guys didn't do anything, and then in. In 2005, right, the Night Horses was formed and uh, and ended up releasing two great records. The first one is a Snowball's a Snowboard Sorrow in in 20, 2005, but also was Stina involved, Abred and uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto as well. That's um, believe it or not, that's 20 2005, almost 20, 20 years ago, and still you know have make repercussion into the music business as well because that's a great great album it's uh, all of you working that and um and i think uh, i don't know if they have, have been have re-released the album again but there are there are very few copies out there and is the copies out there i don't know cd vinyl there are they are very expensive, <laughs> but the, a great album. You, is a great. Um, did you notice that the Nine Horses album was released on vinyl just recently? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. But I think they are uh, willing to publish it once again if it was sold out. I, I think it, it it would be stupid to go out of print. Yeah, uh, yeah. Every time that I have seen copies. Think what's happened, the number that they put out there, I don't know, let's say they were 2,000, right? They will go fast, right? Then they need to do another 2,000 or so. And, uh, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great album. A lot of important people, right, participated in that album. What, what memory do you have from that, that, that period? 20, almost, well, 20 years ago, right? Yeah. It reminds me of my own personal, failure as a producer because i started to mix down the tracks that i was involved with with myself yeah. in my own studio yeah and i would cut off some of david's lyrics because i thought there was too much singing going on so i would start dubbing and fleshing out the tracks yeah. and me myself i wasn't very pleased with the result and David wasn't pleased with it either. So Steve and David asked me to pass the mixes over to them so they could finish the mixing. And I, I have to admit, I gave up on it because I couldn't do it. For the first time, I, I couldn't, I wasn't able to do it. I don't know why. Maybe it just it's the, because the singing is so intense. It's yeah. so dominant. Maybe it's logical that to some extent later on David would completely dispense with the music or have only a little bit of music in the background and his singing is standing there on its own like a monument in the center and it doesn't need anything else. So as if the music was arbitrary, you can also dispense with the music when you have this voice going on where the lyrics and the intonation is so much more important than the rest. So maybe that's why I had to give up on it. Yeah, man. It's, uh, and then the, uh, two years after that, uh, the, the album Money Money for All, it's an EP as well in 2007, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's another great album. You guys never end up touring right as an eye horses no they're... no you know what more generally speaking yeah if you have a singer involved in a band finally the singer will, will always absorb everything because it's the standout figure tubeway army became gary newman Nine Horses became David Sylvian. 
Yeah, it's like the logic of the music business. No? Because if the mainstream cannot deal with the music, they always focus on the central figure, which is the singer. And it's not going to change. So people have always related to uh, relate themselves to singing. Mm. Yeah, instrumental pieces. When 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 have you ex seen an instrumental piece entering the charts? There's literally only a couple of examples. Why is that? No, <laughs> that's one of those questions. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, sure. what I'm saying is he went on tour but not as Nine Horses and he would play the Nine Horses tracks I see, I see yeah. and um, my friend my, and my, my, a, a friend of mine Hayden Schism he would play the clarinet on stage exactly as he he, he, he was asked to play the clarinet in exactly the same way he would play the clarinet on the record. I see. But he played the clarinet on the record instantaneously. Uh, from scratch. It's He's used to do that. It was first take clarinet. <laughs> so it's yeah. completely unnatural for him to rehearse a session take. But, you know, for him, it was a weird experience that uh, David Sylvian doesn't operate like this. Everything's rehearsed. So it's the it's, uh, yeah. way it's determined to be like this. But, yeah. Whereas Hayden would come from a jazz background and I'm coming from instantaneous composing. So we have, yeah. we have trouble being incorporated in, in a system like that. For us, a concert is a concert. It's not a show. And concert means you can obs the audience can observe mm. the artist how they observe the world. That means the more the musicians play at risk, the more interesting it is for the spectator to watch the performance. Right. Yeah. So, I so yeah. In other words, the Rolling mm. Stones are not performing any music. This is an object. It's a ready-made. <laughs> Uh, that's the trouble. Um, that's the, I mean, it's legitimate. The music doesn't mind. It's just an, an interesting question to put put the whole idea of of uh, concerts into question. No? Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. No, I know exactly what you're saying. For me, um, I could listen to a lot of albums at home, which I do on a daily basis, right? And I have a I have a big, big music collection. But um, seeing a band live is very, very important. It, you know, it's not good enough to, I don't know, listen to your music or, or Night Horses or Tangerine Dream or whatever, you know, over and over, you know. I have, for Tangerine Dream, I have like a 30 or 40 albums, right? I have listened to all of them. But seeing a band live, you know, although they are not the same people, the same musician, they don't play on the track, they do extended the feature. Some member left, another person passed away, another person left the band. It's not, it's not the same band, but it's still live music for me, uh, it, it's, it's important. For example, right? I, you know, I never seen David Silver live, but, you know, I would have. I wish I have had the opportunity, right, to see Night Horses, you know, playing live. But as you mentioned, right, there were never, it was never the opportunity to tour as Night Horses. But, uh, but you know, but you were part of that and you have done a lot of great music, man. So I'm, I'm very, very happy for you, man. You know, uh, you know, what happened also, David Silver became very popular with his boys. So maybe it was a lot of demand for him to go on his own with his brother. And he was working with that person, that person, that person. And sometimes, you know, record labels or, you know, or whoever put a gig, they, you know, they put pressure on you, you know, as the promoter, you know, they, they want to sell tickets at the end, you know. And um, sometimes, you know, like, um, 
your type of music wouldn't sell that many tickets as opposed to other type of music or you know did, did you say turntable music yeah you know in general sometimes uh, experimental music wouldn't sell that many tickets yes right and a promoter say okay it's x number of dollars uh, we have a theater of a thousand people right so yes, you know yeah. uh, they kind of impose certain restriction about the type of music that we could play and who can bring and so forth and and you know sometimes you know it, it wouldn't work out financially the numbers right uh to you know tour you know as a group or as a project and so forth so it's it's complicated you know so yes it's getting more and more complicated because the yes. fees are yes. decreasing in a world where everything's soaring in price that's right yeah uh, it's uh, not feasible anymore yeah <clears throat> but here's something to think about i reached the following controversial conclusion live music should have never brought to record whereas electronic music should have never performed and really? because now you can see DJs have taken over the business, more or less. It's so much easier for a promoter to invite a DJ with an USB stick. You have no backline. You have one person only. There's no trouble with it. All the music is mastered. You don't need a sound engineer for it, and so forth. You have literally almost no costs. But All right, yeah. imagine we would have never had any record with bands playing real music on a record. Louis Armstrong would have never been on a record. You only would have the sheets. More or less was Louis Armstrong who was the first to put his stuff on record to sell more notes, more sheets. Sure. Instead, he replaced the sheets. But now it seems the DJ more or less re replaces the live music. But if we had not gone uh, industrially uh, to, to, the, to, to the production of industrial style, industrial style products, yeah. live music would be quite essential, simply in order to, to listen to music. Yeah. Yeah, to the music of the day. You would have to have someone playing the music. Well, no, I know, I know, I know. It's I know entirely hypothetical, of course. Yeah, yeah. But an interesting concept in a way. So mm -hmm. it's not like the camera has displaced the painter. That didn't happen. But there's something else going on with the DJ arbitrarily handling other people's mental property and the decline of life music. Mm -hmm. Uh, unless you are the top five monster bands who, who would always perform around the world. Yeah. yeah, no, I understand. I have only two two last questions. It, uh, what are you working nowadays? And is do you any plan for you to uh, touring? Or I don't know if you have an upcoming tour to promote your music or. Uh, no? I was hardly doing any touring in my life. You know, yeah. we, we, we receive a little bit here and there, yeah. Fly in, fly out. One concert okay. here, one concert there. Yeah. It's, it's and very little back. only, very little yeah. only. No, I'm, I'm not willing to to promote myself. Yeah, that means to accept any opportunity just because someone wants to put me on a stage. That's that's not how it works. So I'd rather do gardening. And uh, we've just last weekend managed to record the material for a new record. Yeah. We is João Paish Filipe from Porto and myself. Mm -hmm. So the follow up for automatic music. Yeah. Automatic music volume two. And then it's going to be that available in 
bad camp, I assume, soon. So where people can buy it, either buy well, the CD or buy the That's for sure, thing. yeah. I'm currently also looking for a distribution because yeah. I was cancelled. You may have seen the cover of my last record, Hexenschuss, the black yeah, yeah, yeah. and white picture. The black and white, yeah, yeah, yeah. The distributor didn't touch it because of the motive. So yeah. I lost my distribution over this. Oh, I see, I see. Wow, it's yeah. difficult, yeah. Yeah. But, well, yes. I hope that it, w it yeah. works better with the next, you know, the, with, with the new album. I hope it works out well for you, man. You are... You are very good in what you do. I like your music. You have done well. You know, don't disappear. You know, it's a it's complicated world. It's a complicated business. Well, and, uh, but you got to do what you do. It's the most difficult thing to disappear mm. these days. Yeah. I'm trying yeah. my best to disappear, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I tried to chase it. <laughs> yeah, you want to you wanna leave. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm glad that I was talking to you because you have a a, a different perspective in life and um, and your music is great. I like it. You know, you you probably you are not going to sell you know a million records or a million CDs, but or or touring a lot of venues and but you you do what you like and uh, you are very good at what you do. And so it's uh, it was uh, it was very nice talking to you, Bernardo. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm quite sure next month we'll do a follow-up interview and we'll do part two and part three and I will talk about music. So I know yes. how you I know how how to find you now. <laughs> no, I, I would gladly accept your Thank offer. you, Richard. Yeah. yeah. To talk about okay. It was very nice talking to you, Bernard. Have a good good evening down there, man. Thank Before you so today. much. Thank Before. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.